Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you here, those of you who are with us in person, those of you who are joining us online, and I know some of you will be listening throughout the week. Uh, so wherever you are, whenever you're listening, welcome. We're so glad uh, that you're part of our service today, and we, we honor you, we thank you, and we're excited to see what God has for us. Now, we are uh, in week two of Rise and Build, a study through uh, the section of Nehemiah. And so we'll be in Nehemiah chapter two. You can start turning there if you like, the first eight verses. Um, but before you get there, I just wanna ask a quick question, just a show of hands. How many of you, just your general personality temperament, um, how many of you generally are pretty comfortable being um, bold or outgoing or, or kind of stepping out and, and being a little bit adventurous? How many of you are more adventurous? Okay, awesome. How many of you are kind of more naturally, um, not maybe a little bit more cautious or uh, maybe hesitant to just jump full in, but maybe you want to tiptoe into the water rather than cannonball? How many of you are more of that? What's interesting about this, just to, you know, not to call anything out, the people who said they were more hesitant raised their hands way more excitedly than you bold people. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know if that means anything. Probably not. Uh, see, I am someone who normally is... Um, probably a little bit more on the, on the cautious side. Uh, and so with that said, one of the times that um, I put myself in a position where I had to uh, maybe learn the hard way in some ways was when I was um, interviewing here. And I've shared the story for some of you who've been with us for the past few years. Some of you who are newer may not remember, may not know it, um, but either way, it's a story where I was meeting the elders. We started searching um, for a job. We, uh, the end of 2017, I felt God really calling uh, us to be a senior pastor and then um, to be able to pursue that. Coming in October, end of, uh, end of October, early November, I was looking at a website called Slingshot to help find jobs and connecting pastors with churches. And 10 years prior, Steph and I were visiting Poway one time, like, wouldn't it be great to live there? Just kind of an offhanded comment that we thought was offhanded, and yet God had put a, a little pinpoint there in that part of our story. And then Fast forward a decade, and we searched, and on that first page of senior pastor jobs in October of 2017, when I started really looking, I see Pomerado Christian Church in Poway, California. I'm like, look at that. Let's, let's go for it. Poway, remember Poway? So we ended up applying, and I had a phone interview, and then I had an interview that was in person, and it was on the same, it was the first weekend, the first Saturday of December in 2017. I remember that because it was the same day as the angel breakfast, and one of our elders, I show up in a suit, and there's still some volunteers and parents around, and uh, one of our elders says, hey, let's, let's go walk around the campus, and I walk around the campus, and I find out he's just trying to hide me in a corner so that not everybody would see that there was, you know, a, clearly a candidate there. Um, and prior, uh, I received an email, said, what would you like? We're having Jersey Mike's. And I was like, oh, Jersey Mike's. I always get the meatball sub there, the meatball marinara. And I told Steph, like, oh, yeah, they're providing lunch. And what are you getting? Jersey Mike's. What'd you choose? Meatball sub. She's like, why did you choose the messiest option you could do when it comes to a job interview? And it's like, I don't know. It was delicious. And so uh, I end up, I show up in my suit and I... Um, I'm eating this thing more meticulously than anyone ought to eat a sandwich. And so I was just nibbling it. And, you know, I'd have like, a, I think we had like two napkins. And I didn't want to be the guy who's like, can I have more napkins? And so I had like two napkins. I would clean and I would like, you know, turn on the other side and try to like reuse, reduce, and recycle as much as possible. Um, and just recognizing that I made it through. I looked, I'm like, okay, like no, no stains, nothing like that. And I remember one of the elders just kind of mentioned, you know, I'm surprised that you got... Uh, that you got a meatball sub. And I was like, well, I just wanted you to know, my quick thinking, I wanted you to know that I'm bold, but meticulous. And that was, that's my story. That's what I'm sticking with right now. But it was just this idea of recognizing, I, I wasn't thinking. But there's another example of being, of a chance to be bold, or maybe an actual opportunity, and, and I'm maybe missing the boat. Maybe, maybe you're like me, where we maybe have a humorous example of doing that. But maybe there's some that, that strike a little bit more, um, just a little bit more at home that, that might be difficult. I was in uh, Zimbabwe in 2011 with a, with a um, missions trip team. I was co-leading it uh, with, from my previous church. Uh, I believe there was nine of us on this trip. And we spent a lot of our time in Harare. We have a mission uh, connection in Harare, uh, which is the capital. 
But we spent a little bit of time as well going to uh, some, some rural areas uh, out in the Mondoro Village. While we're in Mondoro Village, one of the things I had the honor of doing was commemorating a well that our church had paid for and donated, and so it was a really cool moment. One of the other things we did there is we did home visits. And so as we were going through a home visit, uh, we went and we met this woman named Ambujaya, but everyone lovingly referred to her as Granny Ambujaya. And she was someone that was in a lot of pain for many years. She was someone that in their culture, and that culture as in many cultures, um, if a, she was a widow, and so it would be expected that her adult children would take care of her. However, in this case, I didn't know the details, I didn't find out the backstory, but her adult son was not taking care of her. So when James 1 tells us to, that religion that God finds as blameless as this, to look after the orphans and the widows, it's caring for the people who don't have people to care for them. So that's what we were doing. We said, how can we help? One point we got uh, water from a well nearby because she was in a lot of pain. She couldn't walk very well and she'd said that she had 12 years of being in pain. Well, one of the other things we did was there was a, a tree that they wanted us to cut down to get her some firewood. And so, you know, I was with a bunch of college students and there was me and then there was a, a guy who was um, in his like 40s, 50s. And so we all went over there and we have a, we have a, a hatchet, we have an ax and each of them are given like a good solid whack against this tree. And it wasn't a huge tree. I mean, this was, you know, it was pretty relatively small. And it was my turn. So I grabbed the hatchet and I get ready. And I'm like, okay. I take a big, bold swing. And I think the tree jumped because I completely missed. Somehow I completely missed the tree. Thankfully, my follow through, uh, no one was within a dangerous radius around me. And so I was fine. Everyone was fine. But the guy who worked there, we're just going to take that from you. And I'm just like shamed. I'm like, oh my gosh. And it was this moment of like, it was a big, bold move. And it was a swing and a miss in the most literal way. And yet, if I'm, if I'm going to be vulnerable, that was not the biggest swing and miss when I was there. Remember, I told you just a moment ago that Granny Ambujaya had had a lot of pain for 12 years, and she didn't get off of her mat very often um, that she, was, she would sit on. And if, you know, I uh, know the Gospels pretty well, know a lot of the stories, and I'm thinking, there's a story of someone who's on a mat, and I'm thinking there's a story who can't walk or has a problem, and there's a story of a woman who's been in pain for 12 years. God, you're call, like, I, th I think you are calling me to pray for this woman, to pray that she would be healed miraculously, that she would be able to get up and dance and to do all these things. And I felt this tension. Have you felt this, where you feel a tension to do something, to step out boldly? And I wish I could say that my story was I did, in that she was able to be healed completely. I wish that was what I could say, but to be transparent, I, I didn't. That, friends, was my biggest swing and miss that day. It was not leaning into what God was calling me to do and to step out in boldness to pray for someone in need. Now, she still got up on her cane and she was, she was dancing a little bit at the end. It reminded me of uh, Jacob at the end of his life when it's like he, he leaned on his staff and worshiped God. But so I left that place. Oh yeah, see, she still got up. It was fine. But in my heart of hearts, I knew what if God was calling me to pray something bigger and I was too timid or hesitant to lean into it. Friends, we're going to talk about boldness today. Looking at the story of Nehemiah chapter 2, boldness in our prayers, boldness as we're praying for our city. Last week we talked about having a burden for our city, joining other churches and praying for our city. Now we're going to talk about boldness, but this will not just apply to boldness for our city. It's going to apply to boldness in our prayers and what that looks like, what we can learn from Nehemiah, and how we can apply that to our lives. So will you join me in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts for what God has for us? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for each person who hears my voice, whether that's in person, live online, or listening later. God, I thank you that each person who hears my voice is someone that you created, that you form, you shape, you know the numbers of hairs on their head, you know their greatest joys and their deepest hurts, you know and love them. And I pray that they would feel your presence in such a clear way as we open up your word. I pray that as we dive in to your word, I would decrease, you would increase, that you would speak in a personal, powerful, impactful way to each and every one of us, Lord. Help us to lean into you, draw closer to you, and become the men and women you've called us to become. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. So I want to give a quick reminder of where we've been in Nehemiah. We went through Nehemiah chapter 1, 1 through 11 last week. And in that, we learned that Nehemiah had a burden for his city. He found out from a friend um, that the city was in ruins. The wall was destroyed. He had hopes that it was better because there had been a contingency from the Israelites, or Jewish people, that was sent to um, the uh, to Jerusalem a little bit a little while earlier, and there was hope that there'd be improvement. So when he finds out it hasn't, he's burdened, he's sad. He we talked about how he mourns and he weeps and he fasts and he prays, and then we ended on the prayer that he had that ends in verse eleven like this. So it's not on the screen, but Nehemiah one eleven to catch us up to where we are says this. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in answering, excuse me, revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. In other words, Nehemiah had been praying and fasting for a few days, and he prays. He says, give me success today in talking to the king. Lord, may you turn your ear to my words and my requests for your kingdom, for your city for your people to have it be rebuilt would you answer that prayer give me success today as i go see the king and that's great but what happens what what do we see next so the first step we're going to look at is that boldness requires a few things when it comes to prayer boldness requires persistence boldness requires persistence it's not a bold prayer that some, sometimes god answers those prayers right away we see in Joshua um, chapter 10 the idea that they, he prayed that the sun would stand still so that the Israelites could complete the battle and, and win the victory. And he answered right away. That's a bold prayer that happened right away. But not many of us have asked God to keep the sun in the sky for an extra day. Some of our prayers are equally, maybe not equally bold, but they're still bold. It's for a healing of a marriage. It's a restoration of a relationship. It's for kids to have salvation and to know Jesus. It's for co-workers to recognize the need for Jesus. It's to be a light in a dark place. It's to see a hurt or a habit or an addiction or a hang-up to be set free from. We have big prayers, and we know that we pray those prayers, and sometimes it takes persistence to keep praying over and over. Here's how we can mark the time. It ends with what we just read in verse chapter 1, excuse me, and then verse 1 of chapter 2 says this. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when, uh, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. We'll stop there because we don't know, like, just reading that, we learn about the month of Nisan. We don't, that doesn't mean much to us. We just know it's, it's part of the Hebrew calendar. What we learn is that originally, back in the, in the Torah, in the original time with Moses, back then, when everything was written down, Nisan was meant to be the beginning of the year. Nisan is the time that is very important in the Jewish calendar. It's the one that has the, the, the Passover. It's the one that, when Esther is in Persia as well, that it's the 14th of Nisan that she has as her, as her fast to pray for three days that, that God would rescue her people. It's on the 17th of Nisan that the people are freed and the, the favor happens with the king Xerxes. We see that it's the same time in Nisan, the 14th of Nisan is Passover in which Jesus lays down his life for us. See, Nisan is an incredibly important month. It's the first month of the year. It's, it's the way of saying this is when we start our year before the Babylonian exile. Before the Babylonian exile, Nisan was the first month. During the Babylonian exile, they shifted their calendar in line with the Babylonian calendar so that October, or September, October, or Rosh Hashanah, if you know Rosh Hashanah, that's the Jewish New Year now. That's the one that they still use. However, it shows that they've, they've changed away from the original idea to the calendar that the Babylonians... So when the Babylonians... The exile was more than just they were taken from their homeland. So much of their lives were changed, even to the calendaring of their year. Why am I going through all of this? Because we see the tw in Nisan, the 20th, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, that he has this prayer, and he goes in. 
But let's look at Nehemiah 1 verse 1, where we just started a chapter ago, and let's see when that took place. It says, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel in Susa. Kislev, Nisan, well, maybe it's, maybe it's one day later. Maybe Kislev is like January 31st, and maybe Nisan is like February 1st. Maybe there's a really quick turnaround to the answer of prayer. But friends, Kislev is between November and December. So this would be early on in that 20th year, according to the Babylonian calendar. Nisan is March to April. So four months have passed. And there's two ways to read when it talks about his prayer here. You could say that, you could say he fasted for a few days and then he prayed months later, God, give me success today in Nehemiah 1. Or you could look at it as they prayed for a few days in Kislev and then starting a few days after Kislev, he started to pray every day. Give me success today with the king. Give me success today. Turn your ear to my cry, God, so the king would hear me. Give me success. And November turns to December. December turns to January. January turns to February. February turns to March. March, April comes. And if we're not persistent, if he wasn't persistent in continuing to answer prayer, or ask God to answer prayer, excuse me, then what would have, how would the people have missed out? See, we expect and we hope that God, we're so used to having everything at our fingertips on demand that we want God to answer our prayers now. He wants them, we, we, want, we want him to answer them now, how we want it, when we want it, where we want it, why we want it, and what we want exactly. And that's just what we've learned in our culture. It's, it's, it's to be expected when you can order anything online and get it within a couple of days, when you can look at any channel to watch any show at any time and be able to do that, to be able to order food and groceries and have it delivered to your home, we're used to immediate gratification. So persistent supplication or persistent prayer is hard for us, not for all of us, including myself. But boldness requires this persistence. It requires us to ask God, God, we want this, this thing for your glory. And we keep praying. Because when we don't get the prayer how we want, when we want, why we want, and the exact way we want, two things can often happen. One, we turn away from God. We said, God must not be powerful enough. He's not able to help my prayer. Or we think God may be powerful, but he doesn't care. That's almost worse. He can do it and he doesn't. And we walk away. Then we give up on persistence and persistent prayer. And so persistent prayer or or Boldness requires persistence in order to keep praying, even when we see no evidence of it happening. It's Noah still building the ark in the middle of a desert when there was no rain cloud in the sky. It's being persistent and keep praying, even when we don't see the evidence. So boldness requires persistence. Nehemiah prayed persistently for months. The second thing that we see in the chapter here, starting in verse 2, is that boldness requires courage requires courage. Here's how we see the story play out. This is actually the last part of verse 1 entering into verse 2. It says this, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Let's stop on the verse there. Let's hold for a moment. In the Medo-Persian empire, remember, Nehemiah, cupbearer to the king. This is a high this is a high level of trust, right? Because if anyone wanted to poison the king, a cupbearer would be the one that would bring the wine to the king. So this is a high level of trust. This is a high position for, for a slave to be able to be in this or someone in exile to be in this role. It's, it's a big deal. And in the Medo-Persian empire, it was against the law to be sad in front of the king. To be able to show your sadness was something that could be punishable by a demotion. You would, you would no longer be the cupbearer to the king. It could be something that could be imprisoned. It could be imprisonment that comes. If the king was in such a mood, it could be the end of your life. So Nehemiah, for four months, persistently prays. And it seems like God hasn't answered yet. He hasn't yet. He doesn't know what's happening. But 
It weighs him down so much that now we're in the month of Nisan and the 20th year of Artaxerxes and it's weighing him down so much that the king notices his sadness. And he says, "Why you're not sick. Why are you so sad? It must be sadness of heart. And I love this phrase that it starts off the next verse. Oh, excuse me, the, the, the next part of verse two. It says, I was very much afraid, but. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? I love this idea of I was very much afraid, but because it shows, reminds us that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the strength to persevere through fear. The only way we can experience courage is if we're afraid to some degree and we choose to fight, or to take flight. That Nehemiah was afraid because he knew all the, all the cards are on the table. All, all, this is for all the marbles. Everything's in because now that he's been found out as sad, if the king doesn't like his response, he could be demoted, he could be imprisoned, he could have his life taken away. But this could be what he's prayed for. So he has courage. He was afraid, but he still spoke to the king. And he was pretty transparent. He's almost not challenging, but he's almost like, well, why shouldn't I be afraid when my home is in ruins? When my, the city where my ancestors are are in ruins. The gates are burned down and destroyed. It takes courage. Sometimes we have persistence, but then when the time comes, we, we don't have the courage to step in and step into what God has for us. So Boldness requires persistence. Boldness requires courage. Here's our third point as we look at the next few verses together is that boldness also requires clarity. If I just stood up here and I just yelled like very loudly and boldly lots of things, but it wasn't clear what I was saying, which you're like, isn't that what you do every week for 40 minutes? Just don't be mean. No, I'm just kidding. No, if I go and I say, you know, we're doing this, 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 and it's not clear, well, then boldness is just loudness. Boldness must be clear. And here's how we see the clarity come, because this is what the king said. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. I love this because he says, you're sad. And the king was so disposed by the gracious hand of God to be disposed to Nehemiah and to say, what is it that you want? Like, what are you asking for? It reminds me of the blind men that when Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Well, heal me. Help me see. If God were to sit right across, if God was here with you and you have a burden on your heart and you're, you're persistently bolding, uh, praying for something and you're, you're trying to be courageous but you don't know how, he says, what do you want? Would you be able to be so clear in your response? He says, I pray to the God of heaven. Remember, the God of heaven is the title that he uses earlier in Nehemiah 1. The one that he's saying that you're the God of heaven, that there are all these false gods here in Babylon and in Medo-Persia, but, but you are the one true God in heaven. I pray to the God of heaven. It's those, Rick Warren would call them microwave prayers. They're quick, but they can still be effective. He says, what, what do you have for me? He says, what, can I, what do you want? I pray to the God of heaven and I answer the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He explains and summarizes his prayer request for the past four months in a succinct, clear, and easily repeatable way to say what he wanted to the king. He said, if I found favor in your eyes, let me go back. Send me to the city where my ancestors are so I can rebuild it. It's clear. And, he, and how does that, what does that look like? Well, when I was, um, it was 2009, 2010, I don't remember exactly, but I was at my previous church for a few years already. I was working part-time as a part-time youth pastor, associate high school pastor. And for a long period of time, Steph was the one that was working full-time at a nonprofit. 
I was, uh, for a while, the early part of our marriage, I was working at a restaurant and working at a church. Then I stopped working at the restaurant because I had a few more hours at my church, and I was part-time, like half-time. But Steph wanted to, to leave the job at the nonprofit, and then she went to school to become a dental assistant, um, and then she served in a de- or worked in a dental office for a year, and then she got pregnant with Shaylin, and, you know, she decided to, to stay home. Now, I give that context because going into that year when we were going to just be, she was just going to be in school, we were going to be losing her income, and my income was staying the same. So I knew I was, we had talked, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go, you know, we got to go talk to the executive pastor at our church and see if there's any way, if there's any way that they could give me a raise. And not like, this wasn't like a couple percentage points raise, this was a raise that would get us to what we needed to survive as a couple. So I remember going in there and, and obviously praying about it and talking to Steph and being as prepared as I could be. And um, n- you walk into a meeting like that, you don't know if, if you're going to walk out with a raise, if you're going to walk out with a stern talking to, if you're going to walk out with an encouragement to find another role somewhere else. You just don't know. And so I went in there and expressed and shared where we were at and, and that, you know, I would is it possible to get a raise to be, start working full time here so that I can take care of my family, she can do what she needs to do, but that we can still continue to serve at our church. And so he asked me, you know, what's the number that you need? Could you imagine if I just said, uh, more? Like if there's no clarity in that moment, then it's just like, uh, more? Okay, sure, I'll write more on your paycheck and see if that can go to the bank. You know, it's like, what does that mean? It's like, no, here's the number that we need. Here, you know, we talked about it. We could, we could still survive or we could still work and function as we are now with X amount of dollars. He looks at me, talks about it, he's like, okay, we can do that. And they hired me on full time. So clarity was vital though. If I just went in and, and again, was just like, ah, you know, whatever, like whatever you think. And he's like, okay, one dollar. You know, I mean, like it could have been unhelpful, but being clear allowed the boldness to be able to see, excuse me, by me being clear in, in my boldness with that, it allowed me to clearly see how God was working. That Nehemiah was able to be clear with what was needed to be done. And so that when God responds, which we'll see in a moment how he does, when that happens, it was clear that God was working. And clarity is not something that comes just from when you try to wing it. Clarity is something that comes when you are praying, and you are fasting, you are seeking, you are learning, you are studying, and you can come down to, what are you about? This. What do you want me to do for you? This. What's the prayer that you would want God to answer most? This. Now, I want to be clear for a moment in in, in the idea of clarity. I want to be clear that God also is not someone who just follows a formula, right? So it's not like, oh, as long as you're persistent, as long as you're courageous, as long as you're clear, then automatically you you will get what God wants. He'll automatically answer the prayer the way that you want it, when you want it, how you want it. Because we know that's not true in our lives. We know we've prayed for things, things that we are pretty sure that we, would, we know God would be happy with. And it doesn't always respond. He doesn't respond the way we want. But part of the clarity is recognizing that even when God doesn't answer the way that we want, that he is still good. And that what he wants must be better than what we want. Because sometimes what we want... Um, It feels so real to us and God's just on the other corner saying, if you trust me in this next step of faith, what I have for you is far better than what you're comfortable with now. See, boldness requires persistence. In in Nehemiah's case, it takes months of prayer. Maybe for you, for some of the things you're praying for, it's taken years. Maybe for some of you, it's been decades. But let us not give up in doing good. Let us not grow weary in prayer requires courage. In the same way that Joshua was told by God three times, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, three times in 18 verses of Joshua 1, that's God's message to Joshua. We need courage. Courage to step out in the right way in the right time. We need to be clear. And then fourth, boldness requires readiness readiness. 
Boldness requires readiness. Let's see how the response is here. Verse 6. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, How long will your journey take, and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Let's stop there for a moment. The fact that it pleased the king to send him is a miracle in and of itself. And give me a moment to explain why. Because King Artaxerxes is the king that Nehemiah serves, his cupbearer. King Artaxerxes, Ezra and Nehemiah, the book Ezra in our Bible and Nehemiah in our Bible, in the Hebrew Bible is actually one book. It's Ezra and Nehemiah. It's one cohesive story. And in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see Artaxerxes as king. So this is the same king that sent Ezra and gave that delegation to go years before. Now, in Ezra chapter 4, Rehum, or Rehum is a man who writes to the king Artaxerxes and says, do you know that they're rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem? Do you know that this is a, a nation that will not pay you taxes if you do this, that they're rebellious? And so Artaxerxes, the same king, says, he writes back and says, thank you for your note. Um, I, I realize you're right. This is a rebellious one. It's going to stop. So the same king that stopped and denied favor for God's people to go back and rebuild years before is now the king that has shown favor to Nehemiah and has shown favor to say it, it pleased him to send. So even that, knowing the history of Ezra 4 and connecting that to Nehemiah 2, is a way that God has already been working and answering prayer. Let's continue on, though, when it comes to readiness. How do we do that? He says, it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. He had to know how long it would take. He had to be praying and strategizing and processing and trying to figure it out so that when the time came, he was ready. But that's not where he stops. He doesn't just say, I'll be back in three months or a year or whatever. There's more. Verse 7, I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy? And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. He was ready. When the king asked, what is it you want? He didn't just clearly state what was needed. He also was ready to describe how it needed to happen. So let's circle back to the first point, the idea of persistence and how it took four months to go from, give me success today, Lord, as I am, am give me success with this man as I go serve him. We're in Kislev, the 20th year. Four months later, when Nisan in the 20th year, and we're starting to see that God provided the opportunity. Nehemiah had been persistently praying. He had been courageous. He's clear, and he is ready. But is it possible that that block of time from Kislev to Nisan, is it possible that it, the reason it took four months for the opportunity to arise with King Artaxerxes is because God was still working the plan out to be ready for the right time in Nehemiah? Is it possible that in our idea of God's, of, of waiting, we think God's being passive, is it possible that that's when he is actively working things beyond our sphere of knowledge and our awareness so that when the time comes and things line up just so, we're ready to go? Is it possible that our times of waiting and thinking God is ignoring us, he's doing all the work behind the scenes to show us exactly what he's going to do? I mentioned that it was in October that I started looking for, for a job in 2017 for a senior pastor role. I had my own four-month period from four to five-month period that I was resting to see what God wanted. It was in May of 2017 that uh, my supervisor at the time at my previous church, he said, you know, what do you feel called, like pastoralized, what role do you want to have? What, what do you feel called to do? So I've always felt the call and I still feel the call to be a senior pastor. He said, awesome. If that's what you feel like, this is a great season for you. You're 33. You already have 10 years of experience. Like that would be a great time for you to pursue that if that's what you still feel God is calling you to do. If not, I want you to pray because you can have my job. Like I, I'm going to be going into a new role and I want to, you can have my role here if 
if you feel like God's calling you to stay here. So it was Memorial Day of 2017. My family, we met with, with my in-laws. We came down to San Diego. We stayed in an Airbnb in North Park. We went to the San Diego Zoo for a couple of days. And I just remember praying that time. And by the end of the weekend, I'm driving back north on the 15 back to my home, our home up there. I think, no, the, the calling is still, still to be a senior pastor. It's not to stay where I'm comfortable, but it's to go where I'm called. So I let my supervisor know and he was very gracious and and you know wasn't like okay great now go with God but mostly go it was like recognizing okay like we'll come alongside you in that that was at the end of May and it was during the beginning ish of February excuse me October when I ended up um, meeting up with a friend going to a conference at that conference I met the local head of that company slingshot he said hey there's a few churches that that I'm working with that I'm trying to help find a job for, check out our website, fill out this profile. It was on that website that on that first page, I see Palmerado Christian Church, Poway, California. And that gentleman named Todd, he's the one that spoke to the elders and was just able to say, oh yeah, no, I know this candidate. He might be worth considering. In that four month span, I was at a point where I was thinking, Okay, I don't know. You know. I think this is what God's doing. What's that look like? And along the same timeline, it was around that same time in May that Pastor Evan was communicating to the elders that he was feeling it was to be time to retire at some point. And the job search started, you know, it started in earnest. And there would be some candidates and, you know, God didn't open the door for them on both sides. And it's almost as if my timeline and our church's timeline, we didn't know anything about one another for about four months, four to five months. But in my season of waiting, and in our church's season of waiting, God was aligning things so that when the time came, we would know that it was God working. So that we could look back and say, it wasn't part of our great plan. I love this part in verse 8, when Nehemiah says it this way. He doesn't say, and because of my wonderful planning, because of my five-year plan and my strategic review, because of my ability at administration, God answered, or this happened. He said, no, because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. When we pray boldly and bold things happen for the kingdom of God, we don't get to have credit. God gets all the glory. We recognize that God's the one that's moving we get to come alongside him and we could do so in such a way that we are praying boldly. The kind of boldness that requires persistence even when we don't see any evidence that God's working. The kind of prayer that requires courage to speak up and to speak out when the time comes, even when we're afraid. The kind of boldness that shows clarity in exactly what it is that we're asking God. And the kind of boldness that is ready. That is ready to share ready to step into what God has. And friends, as we close, I've just got a minute or two left. What I, this in and of itself is a great idea just for, for prayer in general. But if I may take a two minute aside over here, what I wanna encourage is that this same process of persistent prayer, courageous, or courage being clear and being um, ready when the time comes is something that is very applicable for the people that you and I know and love most that don't yet know and love Christ. It's being able to pray for them persistently. It's being able to, when the time comes, to be courageous, to, to step out and someone's saying, I don't know why we're going through this or I'm struggling with this or my child is going through that or my classmate is, good, whatever it may be. And we say, we could say we're praying for you. We ought to be praying for them. But then would we be courageous enough to say, I'm praying for you, and will you pray with me? Can I pray with you here? Or courage say, Jesus hears our prayers. Would you like to know about him? And then being clear to say, the reason I trust in Jesus is because I know that the gospel story is that we're, God loves us. We're made, things were good, but we blew it. You, me, we all sin. We all do things we shouldn't. We all don't do things we should. And a good, holy, loving God requires a payment for sin. And we can't do it. So Jesus paid for it. 
God loves us. We blew it. Jesus paid for it. His life, death, and resurrection paid the bill that you and I have incurred through our sin. It's wiped clean. The ledger is clear. Paid in full. But you must receive him. We could be clear. But then we also need to be ready. We need to wait for those moments and to see if God's lining something up to not say, man, that would have been a great time to share faith with him or with her. But I wasn't ready. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. Instead, it's stepping into it because I would hate friends for you to have the regret of a big swing and miss like I did. Mine was for not praying for Granny and Bujaya, but there are people you know and love most who don't know and love Christ. May you, may we, may we be bold by being persistent, courageous, clear, and ready when the time comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are and I thank you for your love for us. Jesus, I pray that you are stirring in our hearts. God, that you're stirring in our hearts not just to pray for other people to reach those we know and love most, but that you would stir in our hearts that you would use us to change those we know and love most so they may know and love Christ, to, to be available and to speak to them, to be an encouragement to them. May you stir within us to be the change that, that we want to see in our families, in our city, in our nation, in our world. May we be able to come alongside what you're doing. And when you do something incredible, we know we don't get credit. You get glory. So may you be glorified in our lives. May you be glorified in our boldness for those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.